Thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, I'm uh, Reem Masrooji. I'm the chairwoman of uh, Inash Al Usra Association, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, I will uh, talk about some traditional uh, things in Palestine. Uh, you can start um, with your questions. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll start by just Sorry. asking if you can tell us, it's okay, uh, if you can tell us more about Inash Al Usra, your role there, and what you do uh, with regards to Palestine and the of Palestinians. Yes, uh, Inash Al yes. Um, Al Al Usra Association was founded in uh, Albira in 1965 by uh, some women who initiated uh, this uh, founding of the association and was led by uh, the late Samiha Khalil, if you heard about her. Uh, it aimed to empower women and youth and to contribute to the development uh, of uh, Palestinians, especially uh, in the face of uh, occupation. And uh, one of its uh, main goals was uh, preserving Palestinian heritage. It focused uh, on uh, documentation of uh, Palestinian history, and uh, it formed a research committee for that, and it's been producing a periodic uh, bulletin on heritage and society, uh, reaching this year its 64th issue. And also the association manages uh, heritage museum, library, and archive uh, through historical studies center. Also, we uh, take care of, uh, of children, mainly girls, uh, who are orphans or uh, who have uh, like uh, social problems uh, in our uh, society. We uh, have about uh, 25 uh, girls nowadays and uh, the society is like their home uh, and this is part of the things that we are so proud of because uh, some of our girls uh, got married from the association getting out from the association also we uh, we uh, uh, we make sure that uh, just a minute, sorry for that. Perfectly fine. Uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, we can hear you. It's just the camera is off, uh, it's black again. Oh, okay. Uh, we make sure that uh, 1,300 uh, families of orphans get uh, like uh, financial help every month from the society. Uh, from people helping uh, them. So uh, this is mainly our, uh, our main activity also, one of our main activities. Uh, this is about Inash Al Usra mainly. Okay. Uh, are you showing a picture? Because... Yes, just a minute. Okay. Okay, yeah, the camera is working now. It's a bit mm -hmm. bright, but yeah, okay, now we can see. So, uh, okay, if you can show us the picture again, just because we missed it a second ago. Um, which picture you mean? I think you were trying to show us a picture on camera, or am I mistaken? Because it was black from our side. Um, no, um, you know, I have a problem with the technology. So uh, <laughs> my camera was uh, uh, was off, and then uh, I opened it. All right, it's fine. So we're not here to talk about the topic anyway. So you know, you mentioned the Palestinian history and heritage, and when I think and culture as well. Personally speaking, when I think of heritage and culture, one of the th first things I think about, even though I don't look like it, is I think about food. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can tell us a bit more about more traditional uh, Palestinian and Levantine cuisine and some uh, specific uh, foods and cuisines that are made in Palestine. If you, and if you can share anything you have about that, that would be amazing. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe uh, the most uh, famous uh, dish that we have is musakhan. 
Musakhan uh, is uh, a traditional dish that has passed from one generation to another, and it's part of the colorful uh, rur rural life, usually cooked when olives are harvested and squeezed into succulent oil. A uh, whole wheat bread, which we call taboon, uh, is cooked in a traditional oven, uh, and it's topped with onions, with spices, mainly summa uh, or sumac. I don't know what it's called in English. Uh, I don't know if it has another name. Uh, chicken is cooked also uh, with the same spices, uh, and some of the onion are added to the top and decorated with the almonds and pines. Um, I don't know if you can show the, the photos. I don't know yeah, how we to. Are actually, we're showing some actually. They look very appetizing. They're definitely better than my face. So. Okay. Uh, the dish is usually served to celebrate happy occasions like the harvest, weddings, or feasts. Uh, it's eaten using the hands to cut a piece of the bread and use it to cover a piece of the chicken. A real treat that smells of sumac, pepper, saffron, and the perfume of fresh whole wheat bread. Uh, this is a very nice uh, dish. Also, we have uh, a very famous dish, which is uh, mansaf. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, yes. Mansaf is uh, a heavy, delightful meal, which uses uh, lamb meat and jameet. Uh, which is uh, dried yogurt uh, made in a special uh, like bowls and it's also called kishek. I think it's a, it's a dish that is eaten also in uh, Bilad al-Sham, in the Sham area, in, uh, I mean, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Palestine. Uh, the meat is boiled in water with the bay leaves, cardamom, saffron, and pepper, and a big spoon of uh, vegetable oil. And uh, the stew water is used to cook uh, the jamid, uh, which turns into a pleasant white sauce. Rice is cooked and served on top of grilled pieces of bread covered with the jamid sauce. Uh, this is uh, the mansaf. And also we have uh, something uh, that uh, maybe Hebron is most uh, famous with. Uh, you know Hebron is in the south of Palestine. Uh, it's called al-qidre or qidre or qidre. It's also meat and rice uh, and uh, it's made in the oven. Uh, they put the rice in uh, like, uh, what do you call it, uh, clay things, clay, uh, clay, pot. Uh, clay pot, yes, and it's put uh, in the oven and it's, uh, it's uh, with the chickpeas and uh, added with the onions, garlic, and the pot is put in the oven till the meat is cooked and uh, rice is added to the meat with fresh cardamoms and the pot is put back in the oven till rice is cooked. It's covered with food, uh, ghee, then flipped in a, on a large tray and served with yogurt. Maybe these are the most famous uh, dishes in Palestine. Nice. Uh, I like that you mentioned as well, like some of these dishes may pop up in other region, uh, in other countries in the region. But uh, I think one thing you notice, especially like if anyone is from the region as well, is even though some things appear or some themes appear, everyone has their own unique way of doing it, which is the same. Like, yes. like for example, we have Knef in Lebanon, but if you compare Knef in Palestine and Lebanon, it's almost night and day. Like even within Lebanon, it's completely different. The way we do Fatouche is different. So it's lovely yeah. to see. And I think it's a great window into like how each culture is, is, is different and, and unique in their own way. Even the same meals are done differently or presented differently. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm so glad we're not doing this during Ramadan because I'm so hungry right now. Uh, <laughs> yes, I agree to that. Yeah. Maybe one day we make uh, like uh, cooking together. 
hopefully maybe that could be the next game jam like instead yeah. of making games we cook meals i don't know we'll see uh anyway let's move on now from uh, traditional food and meals and maybe we can talk about uh, about traditional folkloric uh clothing and what people mm-hmm. used to wear uh and i think you have some pictures for us to share as well so like as you can talk maybe we can show the pictures as well because i don't think anyone wants to see my face anymore so <laughs> Yes, uh, as you know, Palestinian folkloric clothes have always accompanied Palestinian life, and uh, it really shows a lot, and it uh, it says a lot about it. Uh, you know, uh, research shows uh, Canaanite uh, costumes that date back to ancient times, around 1,500 BC. However, uh, the ornament of these clothes have appeared much earlier around the Stone Age. Traces of these patterns are found in M. Katfa and Bir Sabah caves with signs that show that they were used for prayers. The most modern version of Palestinian costume developed since the early 19th century with introduction of a variety of textile and embroidery patterns specific to each region, use and occasion. Uh, For men, in the early Canaanite period, uh, men and women used to wear uh, similar clothes, but in a later stage they added hats. And uh, when Islam spread in Palestine, it became illicit uh, for either gender to imitate the other. Different forms of clothing appeared while hats and head covers were disregarded. As Palestinian costumes evolved, a variety of fabrics was used, especially in the villages. Under the Ottoman rule, the tarbush became widely used, especially in the city, and uh, more modern-looking costumes appeared while keeping the sirwal, which is white pants, and the kumbaz, which is a cloak, and the damaya, and the shamla, and the laffa, as variations of head and neck covers, which also distinguish the Palestinians from others in Grand Syria, which is Al-Sham, which we were talking about regarding food and also, I think, clothes. And uh, we share a lot of uh, things together. And uh, for women, as for women, they relied heavily on uh, embroidery and textile, and each uh, as each region invented its own patterns and mix of colors. The dresses would reveal where the woman comes from. So when you look at a dress, you know which city or which uh, village this woman comes from. So uh, with fashion development in general, new strings and shapes and fabrics were used. However, Palestinian women's dresses preserved their distinctive features. Older ladies don't use the same embroidery patterns and colors like younger ones. The dress of a widow would be different from other women. Fabric had to be adapted to weather. Dresses also revealed women's social class and working status. Thus, the Palestinian dress began to narrate the longevity uh, of the Palestinian history. So uh, our dresses talked a lot, a lot, a lot about us, about our history, about uh, the social situation. So uh, I think it's very interesting to to see the different uh, colors, different styles, and uh, different uh, headwears of uh, the Palestinian dresses. Uh, so which is called the thob. Nice. I love that there's so much variety in that coat and all these clothes and like stuff we don't usually see. Like, I don't know about you, but usually when I watch a movie, if there's an Arab, they're just always wearing a bomb suit. They never wear a thob or anything else. So it's, it's good to see that there is actually variety. It's good to remind people that. Uh, yes, like, and uh, you know what? I think that this variety comes from uh, the fact that uh, Palestinians or Palestine, it's uh, it's so deep in culture. It's a very cultured uh, country. 
and also Bilad al-Sham, all of it, but all, Palestine mainly, I think this comes, uh, the variety of, uh, of wearing, of uh, clothes, the variety of food, the variety of, uh, cult of culture things comes from the deep cultural uh, roots of this uh, people. Absolutely, because I think because of the geographical location and the history, of the fact that it's a place that's existed for so long, so many things have passed through there, and so many ideas, and it blends in such a beautiful way. And hopefully, that never gets erased. Honestly, uh, inshallah, we will make sure of it. Yeah. Uh, but one, another way I think where we can make sure that history does not get erased is by sharing stories. And I think one of the final things you want to share with us, with, with us was uh, a couple of traditional uh, stories and plays that were done in Palestine. And I don't think we have pictures for those, but you can share the stories. Uh, so please go ahead. Yeah, maybe, um... Maybe we want to talk about, I want to talk about some plays that uh, our games, uh, people used to play, uh, like uh, there was this game, it's called Statue. Uh, males and females used to play it in the backyard or in the playground. Um, the players were divided into two teams and uh, they toss a coin to see which team will start first. And uh, the other teams try to catch the running team. Uh, however, if a member of the running team claims to be a statue, he stops and see, he says statue, uh, so he can't or she can't be caught. So to come back to life, the statue must be touched uh, by another member of his team and he would still be running. Uh, of course, these games, uh, we used to play them like uh, hours and hours and hours, and uh, they used to be so much fun. Uh, also, we used to have a game called uh, High and Low, and uh, also uh, females and males used to play it in the backyard or in the playground. And uh, also, they choose... Uh, they toss a coin to choose the participant who will stay in the middle. And then the other players, players uh, stand on a higher place and start communicating with signals to move from top to bottom without allowing the child in the middle to take over any uh, of their places. Of course, uh, these games were invented uh, when there was uh, no social media, no way to communicate with each other, uh, but playing with each other. So uh, I remember when we were uh, young, we used to spend like uh, from morning to dawn uh, in, in the playgrounds and uh, outside. Also, there's a game called Hot and Cold. Also, males and females uh, used to play it. This can be played uh, in the house or in the classroom. Uh, any time of the day, of course, and uh, many players can play it. Uh, a person is selected to leave the room and the other players hide an item and the person who left the room must come back to find it. And uh, when the person is close to the item's hiding place, the players shout, hot, hot, hot. And when the seeker is far, they shout cold, cold. I think many people play this, these games, not only Palestinians. Uh, but, uh, for example, my children don't play them anymore. So uh, maybe not only my children, maybe also children all over the world stop playing these games. Uh, so these are some of the games I remembered or uh, I can remember now. But, of course, there are a lot of games. Absolutely. Uh, uh, someone mentioned in the comments, actually, how universal these games are. And it's kind of true. Like, I, re I remember playing similar games as a kid. But the fact that, for example, like, we've played La Pito in, in Lebanon, yeah. which is kind of close to Statue, but we never had a version where, like, if you catch someone, you yell Statue. It's, it was like, you catch them, it's over. That's it. 
So like you see these little varieties and these little changes and these kind of universal games are so wonderful to see. And I love the comment you added as well that kids don't play these games anymore. But I think it's a shame, even though I like video games, obviously, making game jump for video games. But uh, these kinds of games connect and create memories that are truly unforgettable. Like the fact that we you still talk about them, I still think about them even to this day. Like it means a lot, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to do this game jam because games connect with people and create a connection with people that you, you just can't get any other way. Definitely, definitely. And also, you know, Iyad, I think that uh, playing games with each other when you were uh, young helps you know how to work with people when you're old. I think uh, playing is uh, a really a great tool for people to help them know how to uh, manage with each other. Absolutely, I 100% agree. It's it's an underappreciated social tool, I would say, because uh, like you said, like I don't know, some of my closest friends are people that I play games with. Like these are the people that I feel I connected with. These are the people I feel I would probably invite to my wedding or funeral or the Vedisha. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The wedding part, not the funeral, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Inshallah. <laughs> but uh, it, like you said, it creates these memories and these connections. You learn how to deal with people. You know which people you like and you don't like through games in a weird way. Yeah. So I hope people kind of don't underestimate the power of games as they're kind of going through this game jam and in general when they're making games as well uh but now we kind of we need to kind of wrap up so is, are there any more comments any other little stories or thing I mentioned? Uh, yeah, actually we have a lot a lot a lot but uh, these are the ones that the uh, come into my mind now yeah all right. Well, in, in that case, you can tell us if you want about uh, your uh, NGO in Shah Al Usra, and then we can go to the next talk. So, yes. where can people find you? Where can, where can people uh, find out more about Inshas? Like, no, okay. not, I keep mispronouncing it. I'm sorry. Uh, in in Ash Al Usra. In, in Ash Al Usra. Yeah. I see uh, it in English, so I get confused. I'm like, Inash? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, Inash al-Usra is located in uh, Albire, which is next to Ramallah. And uh, you can find it uh, www.inash.ps. And uh, also uh, on Facebook, it's in Arabic, Jamayat Inash al-Usra. Uh, and uh, you can always... Uh, Communicate with us uh, through uh, Instagram page also. It's Jamayat uh, in Ash al Usra. Uh, and uh, yes, and uh, maybe we send you more details about uh, our society in the future if you're interested. Absolutely. It should be already in the resources in Discord. And if it's not, we'll add it uh, in the next few months. Thank you. All right. So. That's it, I guess. Thank you so much, Reem. Thank you for all the knowledge you gave us. And just in general, thank you so much, really. Thank you. Thank you for this effort you're making for Palestine. And uh, I think uh, because Palestine has all these people who uh, love Palestine, I think it will be free soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. It's the least we can do. And... I really hope very soon. Uh, all right. Yes, thank you. it will be free soon, inshallah. Okay, right. thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. for watching. Stay tuned for the next talk. Thank you. Bye bye.